afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm Lorraine Justice. I am the director of the Student Sports Services Program. Thank you for coming. I am going to have our president, Dr. Shannon Kennedy, to give you a welcome today. Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, thank you all so much for being here as we begin our celebration of Black History Month. And I'm excited to hear about the, the program. I'm gonna turn it over to Tyshere Nickens in just a second to give us a little history on Black History Month. Um, but I had a quote I wanted to share with you as we sort of think about what we learned today um, and, and all through the month. But again, it's not just a month. Um, we're, we're celebrating this month, uh, but, but this is really an integral part of all our history. So I'd like to share the words of Sarah Clark Kaplan. She's the executive director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. And she said, quote, there is no American history without African-American history. Further, the black experience is embedded in, quote, everything we think of as American history. So with that frame of reference, I will turn it over to Tyshear. Um, but before we do that, I would like us to take a moment of silence. Um, particularly for our, the two campus police officers at Bridgewater College that were killed in the line of duty yesterday. Yeah. Uh, for all the, the injustices and tragedies that we are experiencing in our world and have been now um, for quite some time, if we could just have a moment of silence first. Thank you all so much. Taishir, I will leave it to you to give us a little history on Black History Month. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for that. Um, so Rappahannock Community College celebrates and honors the lives and legacies of African-Americans throughout the year with inclusion and programming to support our students, faculty, and staff, as well as community members. The month of February has been recognized as Black History Month when our nation reflects on more than 400 years of Black history and heritage. According to the Zen Education Program, on February 7th, 1926, Carter G. Woodson initiated the first celebration of Negro History Week, which led to Black History Month. During this month, we celebrate the achievements by African-Americans nationwide and locally. To learn more about Black History Month, please log on to blackhistorymonth.gov. Now I'm handing it over to Ms. Tamira Vini to introduce our panel for this afternoon. Hello everyone, how are you? Today we welcome Reginald Carter Jr. He is an Essex County native where he graduated from Essex High School in the class of 2007. He attended Virginia State University where he created, he received a bachelor's degree in 2012. He earned a master's degree from the University of Richmond Mr. Carter also attended Rappahannock Community College for one semester in 2008. He is currently employed in human resources for the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice. And then today we also have mm -hmm. Ida Cawthorn White. She is a genealogist, community historian, and retired attorney, an activist for more than 50 years. Her focus areas include African-American, women and LGBTQ plus rights. She has became the first black woman to sit on the bench in Virginia when appointed a substitute judge of the General District Court of the city of Richmond in 1983. White has been a genealogist for more than 40 years. She is the first historian for nine families and managed DNA results for 35 persons. She has presented a numerous state regional and national workshop of con and conferences and teacher teaches genealogy courses at Rappahannock Community College. Pre presently, she has four markers, a different stages of application process. What is a co-founder and president of Middle Kalinsa African-American Genealogy and Historical Society and founder of the Greater Richmond chapter of the African-American Historical and Genealogy Society. What is a founder of Virginia Association of Women's Attorney, Virginia 
associate of Black women attorneys and friends of African American art of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. She is president of the board of the Rappahannock Industrial Academy of You're muted. Tamara, you're muted. Where did I, what was the last thing I said? <laughs> okay. Um, why did the founder of Virginia Association of Women's Attorneys, Virginia Association of Black Women's Attorneys and Friends of African and African American Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. She is president of the board of the Rappahannock Industrial Academy Alumni Association, and she preserves the legacy of one of Virginia's earliest 20th century Negro academies. She served on the History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia for more than 20 years and currently serves on the board of the Middlesex County Museum and Historical Society and the Library Virginia Foundation. She is the historian for Angel Visit Baptist Church, Dunsville, Virginia, and chairs of the church's trustee board. The recipient of numerous awards at the local, state, and national level in recognition of her career as an activist. In 2020, she was named by Virginia Museum of History and Cultural as one of today's agents of change. And then today we also have Sarah Pope. She is an Essex County native and earlier in her career worked in the public history field as a historian at the National Park Service and as the executive director of the Minokin Foundation in Richmond County. Sarah's passions turned into interpreting the past to helping build brighter futures for local students when she accepted the RCC Educational Foundation Executive Director position in 2015, and she still serves in that role today. Her father and grandfather were great storytellers and recounted the past events and people of Essex County. The stories provided an anchor to her as a young person, but some were very unsettling as an adult compelled her to dig deeper to better understand them. Now we'll be turning it over to Ms. Justice who will moderate the panel discussion. Good afternoon to everyone again, and thank you for being here. So you all should be able to see um, my screen on the computer. Um, and today we are here to talk about um, Mr. Thomas Washington, but we're also here to talk about advocacy and sharing the truths, even though they may not be the best truths, in 2022. So this article that you see in my, on my screen is an article from the Gazette Journal from um, talking about the marker, the honest and memory of a lynching victim. So as I'm scrolling down, you'll see where um, it says dastardly lynching in Essex County. And for folks who don't know, Essex County is in our service region, is approximately five minutes from where we are here in Warsaw. And if you are on the Glen side, it's about maybe 30 minutes from where you are. Well, about 50, about 20 minutes from where you are. So on the in the article, they actually have a um, a part of the account of the Richmond planning of the lynching of Thomas Washington back in 1896. And this came from the Library of Congress. And it says, what will be done? Lawlessness dies hard, the murderers at large. In Warsaw, Virginia, March 24th, Tom Washington Pollard was lynched in Essex County at an early hour Monday for an attempt to criminally assault a little daughter of a prominent citizen of that county. This is the first lynching within the state since O'Farrell has been governor. Hang to a tree. Tappahannock, Virginia, March the 24th. News was received here yesterday morning that a man was hanging on a pine tree in the lower part of the county and your correspondent went to the scene. At a point on the public road between Cedar Fork 
At Santa Cross, he found the body of a Negro man suspended from the limb of a tree by Blauline Rope. So I wanted to share that background. And now again, I wanna thank our panel for being here today. And we're gonna ask some questions about not only the life of Mr. Thomas Washington, but also to their work and advocacy and being able to support our community. So first, our panel. You grew up in Essex County or even, or even or near the area. Um, had you heard about Thomas Washington growing up as a young person? And when did you hear about the lynching of Thomas Washington? And I'm going to ask Ms. Basada Hawthorne White to answer that question first. Hello, everyone, and thank you for asking me to be a part of this program. I appreciate the opportunity to converse with all of you. And no, I lived the first five or six years of my life in Essex County, I have always uh, visited family in Essex County and had never heard of this lynching until I guess about three years ago. I was working actually on a lynching that occurred in King and Queen County. And I was looking at the James Madison University lynching website. And that's when I saw that there was a lynching in Essex County. I was quite shocked. I had never heard it mentioned in the community. Thank you so much. Mr. Carter, what about you? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'll echo uh, Ms. Besides' sentiments as well. Thank you for having me uh, to this event. Um, uh, it's definitely a great honor. Um, for me, uh, no, absolutely not. So I, I have been in Tappahannock, you know, all of my life until uh, going off to college. Um, I'm a millennial, born in 1989. So this wasn't something that was discussed, at least, you know, in my, you know, during my tenure at uh, Essex or, you know, in Tappahannock. Um, how I found out uh about it i would say a, a year or so ago we did a protest in tappahannock and um as a result of that protest we decided to uh create a gofundme to 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 do a campaign to remove a confederate monument um in S within essex and at that time um it was suggested like oh well you know it would be beneficial to maybe do, you know, create a highway marker for Thomas Washington, um, you know, a man who was lynched within Essex County. So in doing my research, that's when I learned about learned about Thomas Washington. And, and I decided that, you know, uh, I wanted to tell the story, you know, in, in, as a term, as it relates to contextualization, or like telling a more inclusive story in Essex County. So that's what kind of prompted me to, to look into it. Thank you so much. Ms. Sarah Pope, your answer to this question. In, um, in my introduction, um, was mentioned about stories that I had heard as a young person growing up. And I, I grew up near Dunsville, near Center Cross, where this murder happened. And um, when I was a young girl, my father actually recounted this story to us, to my siblings and me. Um, probably 40 years ago. And of course, you know, when you're a young person, it, it was horrific. And one that I um, always thought about, but you know, you as a young person, you move on with your life. And, but as a historian in my earlier career, um, it kept coming back to me and I always wanted to know more. And when the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama was opened, there was a lot of press coverage on it. That was two or three years ago. And it, it prompted me to start looking on the internet more about this particular um, murder in, in, in Essex County. And I was dumbfounded to come across the uh, newspaper articles that had been digitized and to find that um, the information I was told as a child was corroborated in the newspaper articles, one being that a, a young boy discovered the body of Thomas Washington on his way to school, and that was my great-grandfather. His name was Robert Gray Dillard, um, and I learned some new things, of course, learned the, the name of the victim, and also learned that um, my, golly, great-great great-grandfather 
was G.H. Dillard was the coroner mentioned in the article. Um, there were, I call them citizen coroners in, in counties, rural areas at that time, who investigated the, um, the uh, uh, crime. And uh, um, so it brought that to light. And of course, I, I hope what I was able to, from my family history, was able to inform um, Bethsaida and, and Reggie in their efforts, hopefully. Are you all able to hear me okay? You yes. are? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Pope. I really appreciate uh, Mr. Carter, Ms. White, and Ms. Pope for your answers. So uh, why is it important to have this marker about the lynching of Thomas Washington in 2022? A lot of people say, hey, that was back in those days, 1898. I mean, what does that have to do with 2022? I guess I could start and weigh in on that. You know, the truth has not been told about our history. We look at those of us who grew up in Virginia, you know, we had Virginia history, at least in fourth and seventh grade, everybody did. And that was a very, very biased history, as we all know, just the fact that we never heard the story. And to me, for the community to heal and for their to truly be reconciliation, then we have to know the stories. And so it is so important to tell the story, to tell the story of this man who had no justice at all. And so we have to tell, and of course, what we've said is that this is the only documented lynching in Essex County. It does not mean that there were not probably multiple others. And I think that the scholars have even make some projections and so for everyone that's documented how many lynchings might have gone undocumented so we need to tell those stories so that the community can heal and those the kinds of thought processes that led to those lynchings of yore are still with us we see the contemporary lynchings and it's the very same thing so in order to fix that we've got to tell the stories thank you so much Mr. Uh, Carter, you're a millennial. So again, this is 2022. Why is this important to have this marker about the lynching of Mr. Thomas Washington? <clears throat> I would say for me, because it happened, it's, it's history, right, wrong, and different, whether we agree or disagree, uh, or, you know, justify why it happened. There's no, you know, justification. We know that, but whatever attempt they used to justify it, it happened. And I, I would say for me, it was important to have the marker to tell his story in whatever amount of characters that we could, um, because up until this point, it, it to me, it was as if Essex County had forgotten about Thomas Washington or tried to hide, you know, what happened with Mr. Washington. It was very hard to, you know, ascertain, you know, how old he was, where he was from, if he had any relatives. Um, so, you know, this marker, for me, it's my hope that you know, one, it, 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 it provides a location where anyone could come, you know, eventually and pay their respects. And, you know, my ultimate goal is that one day, whether it's, you know, tomorrow or, you know, 125 years from now that, you know, his relatives can come there to that location and pay their respects to him. So it was very important to, to get that narrative out there, especially to, to change the mindset, because there are certain individuals within, you know, our local community back home that feel that um, they're not from the Northern Neck, they're not from Essex County, and, and they don't feel responsible for what happened. Uh, back in the 1800s. So, you know, I, I, I disagree. I feel like, you know, it's history and it's a part of black history and it's, and it's our history. And to the side point, again, like, you know, in order for us to heal, we must acknowledge the past so that we can move forward. Okay, thank you so much. Ms. Polk. Um, you know, I think understanding all aspects of our shared history, it, it, makes, it makes me a better, um, neighbor, a more informed community member. Um, I think of James Baldwin, the activist and writer, and he wrote that history is not the past, it's the present, and we carry our history with us, and we are our history. And I think the history tugs on us. We might not know it, but those who went before us are tugging on us today, I think. 
And for me, um, what astounds me is that in spite of acts of violence like this and the failure of the judicial system to stop these injustices, the black community of Essex County carried on and they created opportunities for themselves. And that um, amazes me. And it's something I, uh, I, we should be quite proud of for, for our, our, um, our community members. Thank you so much. So I attended the Marcus ceremony, dedication ceremony um, in December, and it was a very emotional and impactful event. I will remember that all of my days. Um, please share, Mr. Carter, and the planning to include the attendance of dignitaries and governmental support that you received for these events. I was very surprised all of the people who were there and the speakers and people came from near and far for this dedication. And it, for me, the emotion, it felt like, it, like Mr. Thomas Washington had just passed and that's how it felt. Um, so can you share a little bit about that, please? Um, so so I would say a lot of the planning went uh, well, came from beside her. So that's why I reached out to her. So um, when it was suggested that we raise funds to do uh, to, to erect the highway marker at some point, you know, I was not familiar with the marker program or the dedication. So I kind of leaned on, you know, beside his expertise. And, and the one thing I said to her is that, okay, although this is in Tappahannock or Essex County, you know, a rural, you know, locality, like I don't want this to be viewed as less than. So I want to go all out and, and I really want to pay my respect and have the community pay their respect. So we just brainstormed who we needed to be there. We, we had a huge outpour of individuals who wanted to participate more than we actually could have on the program. But uh, in terms of who we wanted, we, we kind of identified who we wanted to attend and we went through that process of, uh, you know, extending invitations, being at the mercy of, of, of their schedules and even the governor as he was transitioning you know, out of office, he even decided, you know, to, to do a virtual remark. So it was definitely a big deal. And we just, I just wanted to communicate it that like, this is, a, it's important. And uh, it, uh, we know that he's the only documented lynching and we, we emphasis on documented because we, you know, more likely than not, we know that he wasn't the only one. He's the only one that's on paper. So we wanted to at least pay respect uh, in that regard. And, and it wasn't meant to be, you know, I'm not going to honor him for being lynched. Like we're telling the story. So we wanted to, you know, whether how brutal, or how painful it was, we wanted, you know, that information to be told to the community and, and we kind of bear no expense in doing that. Okay, great. Ms. Posada, Mr. Carter was just saying how, you know, you really helped him. Talk a little bit more about your um, helping and planning of this event. It was a huge and wonderfully prepared event. Well, this was probably about our fourth time. So um, <laughs> my organization, uh, Middle Peninsula African-American Genealogical and Historical Society did its first marker in 2005. And that is right across the street from the public library in Tappahannock is the marker for uh, William Moore, who was a blues musician. And so we, we did that one, we collaborated with the uh, James River Blues Society. And actually we were not involved in the research for that, but we came in at the point when it was time to select the site and to plan the program. So we had a little bit of experience. And then a couple of years ago, um, coming up on three years ago now, our organization looked at the highway marker program and saw that of the 2,600 markers in the state, only about 12% spoke to the experiences of African-Americans. And we said, no, this is ridiculous. So we can do something about that. And so we um, set out at that time. And actually last summer, we had done a highway marker for the Stingray Point contraband, who were um, contraband, who became sailors um, in the United States Navy during the Civil War. So we just had done this once or twice. And so, you learn and you do it better each time. So um, we were able to draw upon that uh, breadth of experience. Okay, great, 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 great. 
So each of you on this panel have been involved in activism in some way. And how and why did you become involved in community activism? And what does activism mean to you in 2022? And how can it be implemented by some of the young people that's on today? That's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> OK. so. I'll start, and I was telling my daughter yesterday, when you asked the question, how long you've been doing this, I think I've been doing it for 60 years, which is kind of <laughs> crazy, but my first um, experience was to try to integrate, desegregate, if you will, the lunch counter at Marshall's Drugstore in Urbana, Virginia, when I was 14 years old, mm -hmm. and so uh, that was my first experience, and you know, the issues have changed, the issues stay the same. You know, I went from uh, actually in the summer of 1963, I was in a high school science institute at Norfolk State and we were integrating and sitting in in White Tower. You know, so I've been doing this with different issues. The, we then started to realize, okay, we're doing this, but black women are not getting their day in the sun. And so I moved into women's issues, moved into LGBTQ plus issues, although we didn't call it then, we just said lesbian gay issues. And so champion all those issues, just I've been doing it all my life and probably will continue to. Okay, great, thank you. That was just the one question. So, <laughs> you, <Sarah. laughs> um, uh, I would say for me, I, I would uh, at, at some point when I attended Virginia State between uh, what, 2009 and 2012. So, uh, learning, you know, I think for me, it started with a mindset, and I say that like you know, learning more of our history that wasn't necessarily taught to me in Essex County Public Schools. You know, I'm a, I, I, think the, I like to think of myself as a sponge for knowledge. So wondering like, okay, why wasn't this history taught, you know, back home and, and learning, you know, of it in college. Now, in terms of action, I would say uh, for me, we, we all know, you know, or I'm assuming we all know George Floyd's story, but I was actually watching that, you know, on, on Facebook or somewhere online as it was happening. And I think for me, uh, I, I so, you know, that that could have been me. That could have been, you know, one of my classmates or my brother or my sister. And, and from there, I decided to, you know, participate in the, the demonstrations in Richmond. That's where I currently reside. And I tell people this is the 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 it, it's strange, but it's 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 true. Participating last year in in, in the riots and everything, you know, in, in, in the demonstrations was the first time that I felt proud to be an African-American. And, and I know I attended HBCU and that was the norm, but that was the first time that, you know, I felt like, you know, the whole world was watching us as, as African-Americans, you know, uh, tell our story and, and, and say enough is enough. And then from there, I said, you know, racial inequality exists all throughout the world, all throughout America, but it also exists, you know, in, in rural counties such as Tappahannock and Essex County. but that's the final frontier, if you will. Like the spotlight is not necessarily on Essex County or, or you know, the Northern Neck uh, because we don't have those major, major media outlets like they do in, in the major cities throughout the United States. So uh, came together with a group of, of like-minded individuals and we decided that we wanted to do a protest uh, back home with, with, in Tappahannock, which we dubbed the, the March on Tappahannock. And from there, that's kind of what, you know, spearheaded, you know, where we are today and, and just like, okay, what are the issues that need to be addressed? Um, what are some things that, you know, we can just, you know, speak on? And I felt like, you know, enough was enough and now it's time to, to kind of act as opposed to sit back and complain and maintain the status quo. So that's my answer. Okay, great, 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 great. Ms. Pope, your work in activism. Oh. I don't, I don't necessarily think of it as activism. I guess it is maybe in this day and age to, to read all histories, understand them, and then to talk about them <laughs> with people. Um, it's very uncomfortable, right? As a white American, a white Southerner, you know, from, to talk about these things. And um, 
I, I read a lot and I think about it a lot. And, you know, um, I think some folks, we, we're not given the tools. We weren't growing up, at least I wasn't in the 70s and 80s, to be able to talk about these very uncomfortable things. Um, and uh, I think the first step is just telling the truth. So I've got, I suppose if that's activism, that's what I'm, I'm doing and um, trying to, to better understand. Thank you so much. Now, what can our college students who want to be involved in activism do today, again in 2022? What can they do? I guess I should answer that since I'm not, you know, so far removed as being a college student and, and I, I still identify myself as a young person uh, at 32. Um, I, I don't want to say it's e easy, but it is. I mean, I feel like, you know, uh, if there's an issue that, that you feel that needs to be addressed, like you have a voice, use it. Um, for me, uh, it starts with educating yourself. So, you know, learning and then applying what you've learned what, what, you know I would assume at some point if you're in college we're college educated whether or not you graduate or not you're college educated if you're not you're educated because you're pursuing you no know, college so um, at least in, in, in everything that I've been doing you know now just with the confederate monument education to me is power so when you're faced with the opposition you know facts it's nothing that you know will refute those facts uh, so I would say there, start by educating uh, yourself on, on you know, what matters and, and then action. So everyone can say, oh, we stand with, or you can share a post. Uh, and I guess to, to a part of your question, I think activism in, in 2022 in this post COVID age, sharing a post is, is you know, could be identified as, as advocacy work or being an activist. And we're all big on social media. So things that are more you know, applicable or appropriate or things that are going on, spreading that word uh, so that way it's, it, it doesn't go, you know, un, that story doesn't go untold. And then, uh, you know, bringing forth actual change. So, you know, if it's just you by yourself, Sharon, then, you know, you, you bring someone, you're, you know, your classmate or your best friend or your sister or brother, and then they shared. And then now this information has been disseminated to the masses as a result of a post that started or something, you know, racial inequality or discrimination that happened, you know, uh, and now more people are aware of it so that way we can act. So I think that's what it looks like um, in 2022 in terms of being a young person. It starts with educating yourself on the facts because the last thing you want, you, you want and, and this comes from my HR background, is to not be deemed as credible or knowledgeable. So, you know, when you're you know, posting, you know, untruths or you're, you're spreading, you know, narratives that are, that are inaccurate. When someone presents you with that hard data, now you're not deemed credible because now, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're just trying to, although we call it causing good trouble, you're trying to, you know, stir up things or you're an outside agitator because now you're, you're spreading false narratives. So education is power. Okay. Great. Thank you. I would also weigh in on that, that and this is for whether it's a young person or an old person, is that if you see an issue and realize that something needs to happen, then make it happen. And Reggie is such a role model for that. <clears throat> I told you that I learned of the Thomas Washington lynching probably about three years ago. And I talked to some folk in Essex County because I don't live in Essex County and although I have deep family roots there, you know, I thought that there should be a little bit more Essex County to work on this marker. And folks sat on it. And it Reggie came along and he did not sit on it. He took action. And the thing that has so impressed me with working with him is he identifies an issue and says this needs to change and starts to make it happen. And so I think that can be a lesson to all of us, young and old, that you know, don't just sit on it, don't just complain, you know, don't just talk about it behind closed doors, uh, find out what action should be taken and make it happen. Great, thank you. Ms. Pope, you want to weigh in on that question? I think I just want to echo what, what Reggie said is, is read, read up, educate yourself. Um, one thing that I try to tell my own children who are college age is that history is complicated. 
And a history, local history is a reflection it's of the lives of the people who live in that community. And we are, um, uh, you know, mankind, we can be heroic and gracious and charitable, but we can also be cruel and do bad things, you know, and history reflects that. And so it's more than just a soundbite or a TikTok video, you know, you can't capture it in 30 seconds. So take some time to, to understand and look at events from all sides and to understand that. Great, 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 great. So what are some future plans regarding activism that you may have to ensure the equal rights for all people? Are you working on anything? Did you ever hear of this man, Thomas Washington in Essex? Dr. Parker, can you please mute, mute yourself, please? I'm sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. I'll start by weighing in on that. We have a number of um, plans that are in process. Um, at this point, I'm, uh, as we talk about telling the stories and telling those African-American stories, at the time that the Thomas Washington marker was approved by the Board of Historic Resources, we had two other Essex County African-American markers approved at the very same time. It's amazing that they're within two miles one of the other. And so um, in about a month and a half, we'll be dedicating the marker for Angel Visit Baptist Church that we believe to be the oldest African-American church in existence in Essex County. Um, I'm a member of that church. We also will be dedicating about a month after that, the marker for the Rappahannock Industrial Academy, which was one of the Negro academies that functioned and was put in place by Black folk at a time when there were no public high schools for Blacks in the rural Virginia, at least. The four or five public high schools were in the cities. And so that's in the process. Um, we are in the process. We have a wonderful research team that is documenting the king and the one king and queen lynching uh, that took place in actually in 1923. And it's been interesting how the community awareness is at such a different level because that took place at a time when folks that most of us have talked to remembered it and they were alive. And so it's very different from that almost um, dropping from community consciousness of the Thomas Washington lynching. But then we're not through with Thomas Washington. The marker was really a beginning and we have signed on with Equal Justice Initiative, EJI, they are the folks who have the, both the, uh, the two museums in Montgomery and we have signed on as community partners. And so there is a plan uh, that the, the knowledge, the teaching is not done with, the healing is not done with. And so one of the things that is happening is you may be aware, uh, some of you, that we did a soil collection from the actual site of the Thomas Washington lynching. And one jar of soil has been sent to Montgomery for the museum there, an identical jar has been deposited at the Essex County Museum in Tappahannock, and that will be a part of their permanent display. And as they are in the process now of shifting and doing a new African-American exhibition, I think we can expect that that soil sample and its explanation will be a part of that. And then, you know, there are all kinds of things we're hoping to do um, a lot of communities that are partners with the EJI have done student essay contests. And of course, we did as a part of the programming just the week before the uh, market dedication, we did a film screening that we had 100 plus people um, on that virtual film screening. And the conversation was such, it was a beginning we have to continue that conversation in our community. So we may be showing that film again or certainly something similar. And so um, there's a lot going on, so many stories to be told. I'm personally working on looking at uh, exposing the stories of African-American businesses in Middlesex County. We've got some uh, businesses that we're looking at in Essex County, stories that weren't told just prior to the pandemic. 
we had done a program on green book businesses in the Middle Peninsula. So those were those Black businesses that advertised in that publication, which there were several in Essex County. Um, interestingly, none in the Northern Neck, and that's an interesting piece that we may want to explore why there were none in the Northern Neck. But at any rate, um, there's so much out there. Our stories haven't been told. And so um, we have a lot, a lot of work to do. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'd say for me, uh, it's just uh, been, we've, st I'm still working on the Essex County Confederate Monument uh, removal. Uh, that, that's a process that has taken us over a year uh, of, you know, constantly going to the Board of Supervisors, going to the Town Council. Um, we, we, we finally got it approved um, in, I believe, June or July. Uh, and as recent as this week, uh, we did have someone come out to take a look at the monument and survey uh, how much it would cost to remove it. Um, and uh, it is our hopes that it will be removed this month. So uh, working on that, as well as I'm personally developing a license plate for Virginia that uh, will commensurate the Richmond planet and it will tell their story. Um, and why I felt that that is important because there are only seven license plates throughout the United States that that tells uh, you know a story in terms of uh, black excellence so speaks to black excellence so we have a lot that are for you know uh, HBCUs or divine nine fraternities and sororities but those are all you know exclusive to those respective members but we have seven throughout the United States that is inclusive and actually tomorrow I will be going uh, before the General Assembly and speak into why this plate should be approved and, and why the Commonwealth should approve it and, and the historical significance to that. So in addition to those two things, as well as, as, as uh, continuing to tell Mr. Washington's story, um, whatever, you know, is relevant, uh, you know, not, and, and for me, my interest is, is rural counties. So like Essex County, that's near and dear to my heart. So I want to tell those stories. So, um, in doing the protest last year, we filmed it, and and I just wanted to to just get the the raw emotions of the community, how they felt about you know race relations as it relates to Essex County or the Northern Neck, how they felt about the Confederate monument, whether or not it should be removed or not, and and the response that I got was astonishing, just because there are you know you would I think you would be surprised at how many people are afraid to tell their true thoughts or express their true thoughts in fear of retaliation, whether it's, you know, small business, not getting business from the locals, or, you know, um, you know, going out of business be because individuals are boycotting them. So I feel like, how is this democracy when you're not, when you're not free to express how you truly feel or as it relates to how do you feel that your justice will be served in, in places like Essex or other rural counties when you're passing a Confederate monument as an African-American or minority as you're walking into the courtroom. You know, so uh, that's just my, my thought process. And I think, you know, it, it starts with the education as well as the implementation and understanding that, hey, removing these symbols of, you know, the Confederacy is not going to change a system that was built, you know, to keep individuals oppressed. So they're just removing the symbols, not necessarily the system itself. So just, uh, you know, just continuing to, to, to continue that conversation and push that narrative. That's my goal. Okay. Can you jump well, back in, Lorraine, if I might, just to talk about yes. Thomas Washington for a second. And we've alluded to the fact that we don't know much about him. And we've had a team of researchers. We don't know his age. We don't know where he came from, really. We don't know his family. We don't know his occupation. And you know, someone made the so true statement that Washington is one of the blackest surnames in uh, America, and of course, Thomas. And so we found at least four Thomas Washingtons in Richmond County, because we know you've seen from the uh, news coverage that the Thomas Washington was lynched, had a connection of some kind to Richmond County. And of course he was lynched in Essex County. And we found four persons who um, could have been 
Thomas Washington. And of course, we were talking last night, the fact that the 1890 census doesn't exist hampered us somewhat because we were looking at who was alive in 1880. But then, you know, we said Thomas Washington could have been an Emmett Till. You know, he could have been 15 years old, born after that 1880 census. But at any rate, we've not been able to um, humanize him the way we would want to because we've not been able to identify him. So that's going to be ongoing. We are still, still researching, even as we're doing other things, we're still trying to identify Thomas Washington. The interesting thing about this case is there are no um, court records that have survived. We solely, we found probably 15 newspaper articles, literally from all over, but we don't have any official records. And of course, he died just right on the cusp of the Commonwealth um, stopping the requirement for death records, which you know, Virginia kept death records from 1853 to 1896, and then they stopped. And so unfortunately, right at that moment. And so we don't have a death certificate. Uh, we don't have a death register. And so Thomas Washington, that search continues because we're really hoping that we can learn more about his life. Thank you. And you know what, um, you've talked several times about your research team. If one of our students or maybe a faculty or staff member, community member wanted to join your research team, they may have an interest in history. Is that possible? And if so, you know, how could they, how could they make that connection? Um, the more the merrier, you know, uh, genealogy and this kind of research are best done, you know, not in isolation, but as a group. And we get together, and of course, we've done it on Zoom, and we all, right now, we're transcribing some court records, and we're looking to see, well, what do you, what do you hear when you read this, or what do you see? And so absolutely, um, we'd love to have you reach out and join us. It is um, Middle, well, it's Middle Peninsula African American Genealogical and Historical Society. What I will do is put the email address into the chat, um, mpaags.va at gmail.com, but I'll put it into the chat. I'll also make sure that you have it, Lorraine, and we would love to have um, different eyes, a different perspective. We would very much appreciate that. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna open up for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I think I saw one in the chat from Reverend Dr. Edlow. So this question. Would you like for me to get the question from the chat? Yes, please. Thank you, Ms. Nickens. No problem. Okay, let me see. I have to go through. Um, all right. There are a lot, we have a lot of, a lot of good comments in here. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to overlook them, but I want to go ahead and get to the questions and we can go back and see some of the comments later where you all can check those for yourselves. But um, the question is, will the monument that is identical to the monument at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice be placed at the Essex Courthouse? Um, and then it also says, beside I mentioned King and Queen County, are there any other documents of lynchings in the area? So I'm assuming the Northern Neck area or Northern Neck Middle Peninsula. Okay. Uh, let me respond to the first part of that first. So okay. at the museum in Montgomery, there is a six foot tall aluminum slab. I'm going to call it that. It's called a cenotaph. And that was a word I had to look up. I didn't know that word, C-E-N-O-T-A-P-H. But anyway, it's this thing that there's one for each county in which a lynching was found. And so it says the name of the county, and it says the date and the name of the victim. And so for some of those counties, and this is not to make us feel that we're better off, but for some of those counties in Mississippi and Georgia and South Carolina and Alabama, there are dozens of people on that county's block. So for Essex County, because there's this one document and then there's one. So in the museum, and I've not been there, some of you I know on this session have actually been there, but for there's a, there are two of those slabs, and I'll call it a slab. And so the one is a part of the exhibition there at the museum. And then once the community has engaged in this community remembrance project, 
engaged in the several programs and work with EJI, then it is possible for that community to claim the other one. In other words, the duplicate cenotaph that says Essex County, Virginia and Thomas Washington is there in Montgomery and it is possible that we might as Essex County claim it. And of course, we've got to do the work, work through this issue, but then even um, a very practical thing is, and I haven't even discussed this with the museum in Essex, they have space for a gallon jar of soil, having space for a six foot cenotaph may be, well, it, it, it's a different type of challenge. And so that is to be, um, we'll have to find out what happens with that. And um, of course, the jar of soil will be there or is there already um, with the jars of soil from all over the country. So that's the answer to the first part. And what was the part about the king and queen lynching? I've forgotten what the question was. Oh, I think there someone are there any other in the area? Yeah, are yeah. there any other? Yeah, what I would suggest um, doing is looking at the JMU website. Um, racial violence, and I've forgotten the exact name, but if you Google JMU lynching, then you will get a listing of all the lynchings, all the documented lynchings in Virginia. And you may find a slightly different list on the EJI website, because I believe that one is saying through 1950, and anyway, the years are different. And so, but between those two sources, you will find, um, I know that there is a Charles City County lynching for which there is already a highway marker. And it's interesting of the at least a hundred documented lynchings in Virginia, only there are four state markers. And then there are probably about three, I think two in the city of Alexandria have city of Alexandria markers. I think uh, Leesburg might have one that's a, a ju local jurisdiction marker, but most of them across the Commonwealth have not been documented. So there's much work to be done. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is what, is, what is the safest place to park on 17 to see the Thomas Washington marker on foot? And is it on the southbound side? It's southbound and the fire station is a good place to park. And so it's interesting, I'll tell you, when Reggie and I met the DOT representative to uh, try to decide where the marker is going, we knew that the fire station was probably the closest place. But we thought, well, is that going to be a problem that you are inviting people to park in front of the fire station? And, you know, maybe there might be an emergency. And the DOT person said to us, well, you know, uh, this is nothing about your rural area, but you don't have enough going on at the fire station to worry about <laughs> blocking the fire engine. So yes, you can park at the fire station, just pull right in and you're right there. Great, thank you. So um, um, Gina McKinley says, is the film of the Essex County protest available? Uh, yes, ma'am. So it's currently on uh, YouTube. It's called March on Tappahannock. Um, you can just search that uh, there and we have, I think, uh, we have a couple of trailers for it as well, but uh, it's on YouTube, just type in March on Tappahannock. All right, thank you for that. Um, and the next question is, is there a community board where events are tracked and how can one keep abreast of planned events? And so this is so this is in reference to like activism and um, and other events as well. You know, social media is just <laughs> wonderful, and um, it has been so easy, <laughs> relatively speaking, to put the word out there. And so there's so many. There are, I mean, just looking at Facebook, aside from you know Instagram or Twitter. But um, there's so many Facebook groups that are ge geographically specific, that are subject specific. And if you keep up with all those, you will know what's going on. I've been so impressed with the young people who have done the Facebook group. And I'm going to get the name of this wrong. Reggie will help me with Black Northern Neck, B-L-A-A-K, B-L-A-C-C-N-N-K, or something like that. But um, 
a group of young people put this Facebook together, Facebook group together just after all the George Floyd kinds of things. And within a couple of hours, they had three or 400 members. By the next day, they had 2000 members and they've topped out at, you know, up in the thousands. And so it, that's that one place is an excellent way of knowing what's going on in the community. And so we found it very, very easy to communicate and to let folks know what's going on. And that's of course, one of the silver linings to the pandemic cloud is that we've been able to involve people from all over in these virtual gatherings and just to get the word out. And so um, you can find out what's going on in the community. And of course, for our genealogy society, we invite you to our website, uh, which I'll try to put into the chat as well, um, and our Facebook page. Thank you, Ms. White. And this question is, is um, for Ms. Pope. It says, did your great grandfather share very much detail about his discovery of Mr. Washington? What effect did it have on him? And you mentioned he was on his way to school, so he must have been very young. Um, well, my great grandfather died in the 1940s. So this was told to his son, and then to his son, and then to, to me. Um, and my father wrote down a lot of the stories he had been told. And so I was able to reference that. Um, and yes, he was he was actually a teenager um, and he lived about an eighth of a mile where from where the lynching happened. And he was on horseback traveling along the old Tidewater Trail that's Route 17. And the story, the written story that I have is he rounded a bend and I'm, I'm reading it from from it and came upon a black man hanging from a large tree near the side of the road. And this man, while bringing firewood into a bedroom of an Essex home, came upon a white girl who was undressed. And what else happened at that time is unknown, but the man left for Sharps across the river. A vigilante group went to Sharps by boat, captured the man, took him to Bowlers, dragged him up the road where they hanged him at the spot where Robert Gray, the, the boy, passed the following morning. And this was a terrible experience for him and one he remembered with his son in later years. You know, reading that really brings the violence alive, you know, and what Mr. Washington must have felt. It's, um, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pope. And everything else that's in there um, in the chat are comments. Um, and so, Lorraine, would you like for me to read those as well? I, I think we're good for the fact of time we um, got to end. But I just want to thank our panelists for coming and sharing your stories and all of the participants for coming and for the leadership at RSEC, and especially our president, Dr. Shannon Kennedy, for these events. And also too, I wanted to let you know, we have some other upcoming events coming up. And if you're interested in getting information to you and you're not part of the RCC family, please type your information in the chat or either email me ljustice at rapahannock.edu. So we um, are gonna have a, um, on February the 16th, um, Black History on Film, where we're going to look at the hail storm of John Dabney in Virginia. You look at the film and then actually on the 16th, you come in and you will actually get to be in the room with the filmmakers, the producers of this, along with some of the contributors and cast members of John Dabney uh, from out of Richmond, Virginia. And some people may have connections. There's a lot of Dabneys in our area. Also too, the Virginia Community College system um, will be um, offering, um, an HBCU virtual transfer fair on February the 16th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. So if you're a student wanting to transfer, uh, that is definitely available to you. And we have Hampton University, Norfolk State, Virginia State, along with some others that's going to be doing that um, for um, virtual transfer fair. And we also will be having some Black History pop-ups. So you'll check the email, check the website, um, check um, social media about a pop-up a Black History event that we'll be having. So we're going to have some Black History trivia, day and night events. 
but we're also going to have a special guest, the Towns family, and their connection up from the 19, I think, 1960s up until 2022 with the um, Governor's Mansion of Virginia and the Towns family from King and Queen County. So that's going to be the week of February the 24th. Not exactly sure the date and the time, but it's going to be during that week. So again, look at your emails or email me. And uh, we're going to be having some great events throughout the month. And we may be planning some others, but we're going to also have, again, those Black History pop-up events. Okay? Does anyone else have any other questions? All righty then. Well, I want the panelists, before you leave, to give us one sentence closing remark that you may have. I'd ask y'all to, to do something like that. Uh, thank you for having me, first and foremost. Um, I guess my one sentence is uh, to, to echo the, the event, Thomas Washington's life mattered. And uh, unfortunately, we could not tell his complete story within the character limit that was uh, allotted to us by uh, the Department of Story Resources. But we, I encourage everyone to do their independent research on Thomas Washington or any other uh, lynchings and, and, and let's work to, to tell their story as well. Okay, wait a minute, y'all, before you go on, I'm sorry. Donnell Barber, we didn't see your comments. Can you put your mic on, please? Donnell has, and I'm from Sharps, and I remember my grandfather telling me that his mother told him the story. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yes, it, it, when, um, when Ms. White said the name Thomas Washington was from Richmond County, I can remember my grandfather telling me that his mother told him about a young man that was lynched from Sharps, and we are from Sharps. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't live there now. I live in Ocoee, where we have the July Perry lynching, uh, but I will reach out to one of my cousins who has done some more genealogy research and see if she has any additional details. My oh, great grandmother cool. was 112 when she died and my grandfather's been dead 30 years. So, you know, there may be some additional information that, that we'd be glad to share. One of the things we did do is I owned a house in Sharps that was next door to what used to be a lot a, what do you call it? The Oddfellows Lodge. And about five years ago, we went in that old building and we found a lot of records from the Oddfellers meeting and we turned them over to the Richmond County Museum. So I don't know if there's any additional information there, but I'll definitely see what I can find out. Thank you. Well, Ms. Barbara, if you could put your information, um, I guess you can just send it to me directly and I'll make sure that Ms. White gets that, okay? Okay, I certainly will. Great. Wow. I've given I've given Miss Barbara my phone number. I okay. saw that. And Miss Barbara, we'll be happy to communicate with you. One of the things that we haven't been able to reconcile that we found was that an observer who was actually connected with the Gloucester uh, Academy, which was a Negro Academy at Cape Hosick in Gloucester, in the newsletter for that group. Um, the writer reports that he ran into this old man who was begging in Richmond County and that the old man had a wooden leg and walked with a cane. And then this writer reports that three days later, that person who was begging was lynched in Essex County. And the time frame is the same mm -hmm. as the Thomas Washington lynching. And so we've not been able to reconcile, you know, wouldn't you think that uh, as they describe everything that's in Thomas Washington's pockets, would not they bother to say he has a wooden leg um, <laughs> or he is a, that he's an amputee? Yes. Uh, so anyway, but that's something we really be happy to share with you all we know, and then maybe uh, you can help us. And I certainly appreciate your weighing in and letting us know that you have information. All right. 
I don't know that I have any information, but I do have that story. So yeah. <laughs> we the will fact see. That, the fact that you've heard of it is remarkable because except for the, the Dillard family and my family, <laughs> Sarah and I are cousins, um, except for the stories in the Dillard family, we've only talked to one other person in Essex County who ever heard of this. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that you've heard of it Mm -hmm. is in itself remarkable. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I guess on that note, we will end unless uh, Ms. White or Ms. Pope have anything they'd like to say to end our panel discussion today. The only thing I'll say is just when you, when you see something that needs doing, you know, it's the whole uh, religious biblical concept of I'll go if I have to go by myself. So just, you know, do what needs to be done, even if you're the only one doing it. Thank you. Ms. Pope. I can't really top that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I just, I think best sided too for mentioning that we are cousins. And that's a whole nother story. We could we could <laughs> talk about how we're not only intertwined, many of us in this region from stories, but through DNA too. And that's a story we I'm very interested in and always like to talk about and tell that story. We actually have two family connections. One that is we actually related, and then we have an additional relationship by marriage. So we are interconnected. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being a part of our first Black History program. And again, if you're interested in hearing more about um, the Black history in our area and all over the world, please, please go to you know blackhistory.gov. Also come back to some of the events that we'll be having throughout the month and throughout the year. Definitely go to www.rapahannock.edu and see these events there and also our social media pages. Thank you and have a wonderful day and thank you for your participation. Thank have a great you everybody. Day. Bye.